Mr. Tim Kirby. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Uh, been been waiting to do this for a while, yeah. and uh, now that we're uh, making, uh, I guess, the, the official archives for the Texas Martial Arts Hall of Fame, well, here we go. Uh, excellent. I'm honored <laughs> to be a part of the Hall of Fame and honored to do whatever I can. Very good. What I like to do in an interview is, I give you a chance, I want, I want you to tell your story. We're going to go back to day one all the way up to, to now and try to get, try to get the highlights. And, well, and I'd like to, like to start off with what made you do it? What made you start this thing off? Sure. Well, I was 12 years old and uh, really loved sports. I came from a baseball family, but I had dyslexia and I had scoliosis. So I wore a metal girdle for like two or three years growing up. So while all my friends were playing team sports, I was in this metal girdle and so I wasn't the best of athletes. Mm -hmm. So I thought martial arts would be a good kind of individualized thing and getting picked on a little bit too. And so I went and started karate. My uh, sister's boyfriend, one of his best fr friends, taught martial arts. His name's Bob Beasley. He's president of AOK, for, promotes the United States Karate Championships. And that was my first teacher. Uh, he was a brown belt at the time at the Southeast YMCA. And, and there weren't that many kids in karate back then. No, no, 12 years so, old is pretty young. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was a little bit tougher deal back then. And so I, did, I remember after my first class, I knew I was going to be a black belt. Nobody else believed me. But, uh, well, that's I the most important is that you believe. You yeah, know? I knew I'd found my uh, niche. What was that like in your first class? What was that experience like? I remember I had real big bell bottoms on. I slipped on the floor and fell down quite a bit. <laughs> 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 and then we marched in four balance for about 45 minutes. I thought, well, this isn't real fun, but but it's the way it's, karate yeah. was done back then. Yep. I'm thankful for it. And, and uh, so that I became really interested in really loving it. But I could only go once a week to the Southeast YMCA in Pleasant Grove, and I lived in Richardson. And then they opened a Texas Karate Institute in Richardson. And I was the first guy to sign up. In fact, a gentleman, David Archer, signed me up for okay. karate. And then I became a product of Ronnie and Dennis Cox. And uh, oh, yeah. they, were, they were my head, my head teachers. Um, Dennis Cox taught me from white belt to brown belt, and along with Bob Beasley, and then and Mr. Archer, and then Ronnie taught me from brown belt to black belt. And, yeah. They were really tough guys. You see, you see the beatings. And I say beatings, it, it was such, how, how, how would I say this, and I've heard this before, uh, the, the self-correcting pain. <laughs> That's maybe a good description of it. I can remember riding my bike to karate, shaking, because I knew the whooping I was going to get. But I still rode. But you're still going I was there, still yeah. going. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and in fact, Dennis, was the hardest teacher on me coming up. He was just really hard on me, and, and he used to always say, well, "You think I'm tough? Wait till my big brother teaches you." You know, he doesn't think it's good karate unless there's an ambulance parked by. And, and then he came <laughs> one day and said, "Well, I, it's okay, Tim. I'm going to become a police officer in Arlington. I won't be teaching anymore, but my big brother's going to come be your teacher." And I went home and told my parents I was quitting karate because Ronnie Cox was coming. And <laughs> my dad talked me into going. It's the best thing I ever did. He, yeah, he was like my second father. And, awesome. Uh, and once I got to the brown belt level, uh, I was real fortunate. Greek started, Demetrius Vanna started trying to talk me into working out, but one of the gals that I worked out with, her and Raymond became friends, and uh, he started coming over and teaching me, and that's when I really started learning martial arts. I mean, yeah. Mr. McCallum, once I started hanging with him, he just took me to a, a whole new level, and I, I credit him for most of my powers of winning and competition he's the one that really installed that more than more than anybody and uh, I have a lot of people tell me I, I look a lot like those two guys when I fight Demetrius Vanis and Ray McCallum best compliment a man could have yeah, I, I would think so. Uh, so when did you start competing I started competing you know as an orange belt uh, didn't go real well for me I, I got a fourth place trophy my first tournament cried the whole time and then I went like 15 more tournaments before I saw another trophy. Luckily, I got a little one that first time, which I just found out a couple years ago. I didn't really win that trophy. Everybody just got one that entered. <laughs> but that was a good thing. <laughs> and uh, so but by the time I started to get to be a blue belt, I started having some success. And by brown belt, I was starting to, to place and win as a junior. Uh, had a lot of success in the junior division. and and, and at that time, I started competing with the men in form. Uh, I'd do the junior fighting and then the men's form, and 
became pretty good at forms. And, uh, some people tell you, I'm, there's several guys that are really great in forms in Texas, but but I'm one of them. I, I won mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of stuff in form. And, in fact, I quit doing form because people started just acknowledging me as the form guy from Texas, and <laughs> I wanted to be known as a fighter. Yeah. And, uh, I really loved the sport karate. And Texas was so rich in its history, and I was a big fan of it. And if I lost my first fight, I never left till the last black belt match. And, mm -hmm. You know, if Raymond or Greek was fighting, I was right there with my eyes open, just not missing a beat. And There's something that's uh, not practiced as much today. I see people as soon as they lose their fight, they're, they're gone. Out, they're out the door. Yeah, tournaments yeah. nowadays. By the end, of, by the time the black belts fight, it's mostly their friends and family or yeah, students. There's no one else there. It's a ghost town. And it used to get bigger at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. People came just to watch us fight, and we really put on a show and fought really hard, and, and it was exciting stuff. And it got lost somewhere along the way. But still, great stuff, but yeah, it's a little different. Uh, now. Who was your biggest mentor? I mean, I mean, I know you mentioned a couple of big names there that took you in. Yeah, but who was your biggest mentor? I, I, well, I'd say you know I'm a, I'm a product of four or five real different black belts that had a huge influence on my martial arts. First, Dennis and Ronnie Cox, mm -hmm. and then Mr. McCallum and Mr. Havanis. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'd say Raymond's my biggest mentor. Uh, just the lessons he taught and stuff that just clicked to me, mm -hmm. and, and you know. Mr. McCallum teaches a little bit through terrorism, which was uh, a, a good for me. I can I can account and for that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, if you hadn't uh -huh. been bit on the rear end by Ray McCallum, he doesn't really love you. <laughs> so, you know, I remember coming home, my gi was bloody in the back. My mom's like, what happened? I said, Raymond bit me. <laughs> He's crazy. <laughs> my dad laughed. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, I just, you know, love martial arts. Yeah. And, 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 uh, his, you know, just some really neat people. Now, when you got to the teaching levels, did you start to teach right away? Yeah, I, I, in fact, when I was a brown belt, I started teaching extensively. And mm -hmm. the time I was a black belt, when I earned my black belt at 16, I went to work for Mr. Steen as one of his instructors. And, and in fact, I taught for him and Mr. Avanis at the same time. And, and teaching was always my forte. I'm, I'm most proud of my my accomplishments as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I've really put out some of the finest black belts in Texas karate history and uh, developed a good reputation as a good teacher. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest compliments I ever had at a tournament, Troy Dorsey walked up and he said, hey Tim, how'd your students do today? And he goes, you know, that's the stupidest question I ever asked because I know how your students did. <laughs> uh, that was a good feeling. So that's good. I, I really love teaching martial arts. Absolutely. <coughs> now, what what happened when Demetrius Havanis passed away? What was that like for you? It was pretty traumatic for all of us, and, yeah. and we were numb. Of course, it happened three days before the Karate Olympics down here in Houston, and me and Billy Jackson and Ray McCallum were going to be a team and go down there and win this. Mm -hmm. He was giving like fifteen hundred dollars for a black belt team championship, and we were going to go. And then Greek died in a plane crash, and we just all decided we wouldn't go and. My dad talked us into going. He said, you know, Greek would want you guys to go and win that. Yeah. And, and it was a huge moment for me because I think it was the most emotional fighting I ever did. And it, I just changed as a fighter that day. I grew up, you know, and I just yeah. decided I'd start representing him and what he was all about everywhere I went. And I've tried to do that. You know, I've, I've worked hard to, to keep his legacy alive and to be a part of that. Now, when I, when I do the interviews, I don't ask this question of a lot of them, but I know with, when you mention names like Mr. Vanis, Mr. McCollum, and, and Mr. Cox, you're testing for black belt. What was the prerequisite before you were even allowed to test for black belt? Were you, were, was it one of those things where, and I'm, I'm going to come right out and ask you, did you have to actually get into a fight? I mean, go out there and hit the streets and fight. No, I, I didn't, but, but I was given the impression that I would. <laughs> and that that, that that would happen after I'd earned my black belt, that yeah. I would have an initiation in a bar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Cox took me out one night, and we're sitting there, and he goes, pick one out. 
I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, well, we're going to start some trouble and pick one out who you want. And I just like, it didn't, didn't materialize. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, it was a, uh, a black belt was a, a big deal. And, and I tell people I, I earned my black belt. I, I wore it for two days. I showered in it. Mm -hmm. That's how proud I was of that belt. And, uh, what I what I did to achieve it, and it was just a. Uh, I it more important than my birthday, I think, is the date I earned my black belt, December fourth, nineteen seventy six. The biggest day of my life, probably. In, in a sense, it's a birthday in and of itself. I mean, yeah, I can't imagine realize. who I'd be without it. Yeah. It does change your life. I, I, I've been to a lot of martial arts seminars where they say, "Well, you wouldn't sell that black belt for." A million dollars. Well, I probably would, <laughs> but <laughs> but it's not the belt itself. It's it's the it's, journey in getting yes. it and what it's all about. And, and we have a high standard in Texas of a black belt, really created by Alan Steen. I mean, his black belt exams were known to be tough, and and then Pat Burleson probably even was a little tougher, and Larry Castor was even a little tougher. You know, <laughs> these guys just if you got a black belt from those guys. You were the real deal. It was the trial by fire. You yeah, know? yeah. The, the, only the real guys succeeded at that point. It's really neat. Has it been frustrating you, uh, for you and, and with seeing modern day martial arts, where my my view of it would be that instead of pulling people up to the level and standard, they're just lowering the level and standard. Is that what you what you see happening? Yeah, I mean, to me. Especially speaking of Texas, I always think of Bill Wallace saying, you know, a point in Texas is capital murder in California. Yeah. Such a great quote. And there was a point when the fighters came to Texas, they had to fight our way. Really because of the judging, what was an acceptable point in Texas. Mm -hmm. At some point, we started calling the same points that were being called throughout the rest of the nation. And I, I think the competitors are going to go where you allow them to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it's that the, the athletes are faster than we were. They, they do more amazing stuff than we ever did. But ours was a little more real deal. You know, it's just, you, you've got a better, better representation of what martial arts could really be and how devastating yeah. it could be. You know, a break was just a point to slow, you heard the word break, that meant, you know, slow down or wait for the referee to pull you off. Didn't mean stop. <laughs> well, I mean, I know a lot of the guys, the the aerial kicks and the the 360s, 570s, or oh, yeah. there's so many different. And I gather when you're not getting knocked out cold upon landing those kicks and missing your target, that tends to promote the idea of actually doing those kicks more often. I would, I would imagine if you were knocked out cold when you missed right, one of those. there's a consequence to it, <laughs> you, you change. And, uh, in my yeah. life, you know, I, I haven't been the best lesson learner in life, but in the ring, you, you get me and, and I'm going to figure out a way to take care of that. Yeah, necessity. One of my yeah. most proud things as a fighter, there's only one guy that I fought more than once, other than Mr. McCallum, my teacher, that I wasn't able to beat. So there's a guy, Al Garza, we fought three times. He beat me all three times. But other guys, if you beat me, I was going to figure out, I was going to make it a lesson. Yeah. And I was going to learn how to, to overcome it. And uh, I, I prided myself on being an action fighter. You know, when they said go, I was going to go. And put on a show, kick yeah. people in the face and have some fun. <laughs> so what is martial arts in your life today like? Well, it's it's different I'm, I'm not as active in the sport mm -hmm. aspect of it as as maybe I'd like to be or, or, or just am at this point but still teach on a daily basis I have a school in Allen okay. Texas and uh, doing well and still training people and love karate you know I want to see it grow and, and change uh, I uh, used to promote a lot uh, fights and that mm -hmm. type of thing kind of plan on getting back to doing that again okay so, lesson, say, say you, uh, what, what's your best advice you can give to someone that's just, just coming into martial arts? To, to embrace the basics, the, the mm -hmm. fundamentals of it. I see a lot of people learn nowadays in modern commercial karate schools. I think there's a difference. There's professional karate schools and commercial karate schools. Yes. And I try and have a professional school. And we still march in balance and we still spend time doing the basic stuff because when it comes down to a real deal, 
That's what's going to save your life, not the 720s and the, you know, it's, it's that foundation. Mm -hmm. And so as a beginner, I, I was always so glad that, that that foundation was laid, and I try and lay it with all of my students, it's a strong foundation. And, to, and to, to not hurry, you know, enjoy the journey. Yes. People yes. nowadays, we want to rush to everything. And yeah. martial arts didn't move that way, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at us guys getting all these degrees now. It just means it's been a long journey, you know. Yeah. You, you, and that's what it's all about. I think the best advice I got from my instructor was, Steve, the secret of martial arts is to stay the lowest rank you can for as long as you can. There you go. And that's what he told me. My best friend, Chico Goldman, was, he didn't want to be a test for black belt until he was the number one brown belt in the state of Texas. It took him six years to do that. And I always respected him so much for that because yeah. he didn't test for black belt until he achieved that goal. And it's just, uh, I think that's another thing, you know, you always got to set goals. My first karate tournament I went to watch as a student was the Texas State Championships. And that Demetrius Vanish. I'm sitting on a chair and he starts kicking at my head and he looks at me and goes, man, you got a great nose for a fighter. And push it up there. And he goes, Maybe someday you'll be up there fighting. I'm going to go win this title now. And I looked at my sister. I said, I'm going to be a Texas State karate champion. She laughed at me and said, you're never going to be Texas State anything. And for six years in a row, I took second place at the Texas State Championship. Uh -huh. But I kept going and kept Yeah. And finally, when I won it, the biggest day of my sport career was to win the Texas State Championship. I waited till about three in the morning and called my sister up and said, guess who's the Texas State karate champion? That felt good. It felt really good. Awesome. In fact, I beat Al Francis to, to win that title. You just interviewed him. Yep. And uh, I was telling him last night that I really learned to be a pro from Al Francis because he'd whoop my butt every weekend. I lost to him eight times in a row before I beat him. <laughs> uh, but that's when I beat him, Texas State Championships. It was a great night. Well, Last guy. Yeah. The, the secret to a lot of black belts is, and the reason why they're black belt is they stayed a little longer than the guy that quit. I think that's know? life's deal. Most people in all of our walks, spiritual walks, mm -hmm. business, we always seem to quit right before we get to where all the blessings are. You know, it's funny. I hear that a lot, you know, the, the, that so many times people have left something right before a major promotion in life. Not so much rank, just that promotion in life, that next level where they just you stay just a little longer and those are the ones that made it, you know, yeah. that didn't give up. Well, it's been. Well, I often tell people, that, uh, you know, that if you if when people say, "Well, I've heard a lot about you," I say, well, "I don't know how to take that sometimes," you know. <laughs> but you'll never hear me be called a quitter. Yeah. And you know, I'd like to perceive myself as Troy Aikman or Emmett Smith, but I'm probably a little more Michael Irvin. But regardless, I know what it's like to strive to be the best I can be and and to not give up. And that's Absolutely. what it's all about. Good That's advice. What it's all about. Good advice. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Hey, what an honor. Take and, uh, care. Keep doing what you're doing. It's a great thing. Texas needs this.